Thank you, sir. Uh, he has agreed that it is a seri serious reading book and uh, acknowledged that how we have hung up with the colonial systems and the constitution which was with the idea of Bharat was written and we young Indians should read this book. Thank you very much, sir. Now we'll, let us move on to a much avoided part of the event. Sri Sai Deepak will se set the context for the today's event followed by question answer session. I request Sri Sai Deepak to take over. Thank you. Good evening. So uh, let me start with an expression of gratitude to Manthana Mysuru, its organizers, and the brains behind it for uh, giving me an opportunity to launch this book in the city of Devi Chamundeshwari. And uh, uh, I've said this just a couple of days ago. In fact, on 25th of October, I had an opportunity to share space with uh, Sri B.L. Santoshi as part of the launch of another organization in Bangalore that uh, if at all there is, let's say, a state which can legitimately claim to host the intellectual capital, at least currently, I'd say that space is jointly shared by Bangalore and Mysore. I said this before. <laughs> and uh, since that statement is already on record, rest assured this is not a statement made for public consumption. So um, uh, I've said this on, on that occasion as well that this is perhaps one of the few states that has managed to strike a decent balance between three different uh, strains or flow, let's say waves of human thought. One is the need to celebrate, one is the need to celebrate what belongs to you and what is perhaps your closest identity, which is the, uh, the identity as a Kannadiga. The second is keeping an, uh, an open mind to ideas that come from outside. And therefore, there is a degree of cosmopolitanism that pervades Karnataka as a state and certainly these two cities. And three, that it is possible to strike a fantastic balance between the past and the present without the past necessarily being relegated to, uh, let's say, the status of a relic in a museum is something that the state brilliantly demonstrates. And I can't think of a better city than, in fact, Mysore to showcase this particular aspect. Because uh, every time you pass through this particular city, you wonder at the, the spirit of the city to keep its architecture alive, its buildings alive, and to somehow, let's say, stem the, the rapid movement of so-called development in such a way that it submerges whatever is native to this particular city, the spirit and culture of this particular city. So kudos to the spirit of Mysore and the people of Mysore for having done what you have. I wish there were more cities in this country that could emulate this particular model. Second, uh, this particular event was meant to happen at least two years ago where I was meant to interact with the denizens of Mysore. But I think it was destined that I come here to launch my book finally. And uh, thanks to Darshan Raji and his entire team for their perseverance and their doggedness in ensuring that I land in this place. And uh, I'm very, very happy that I've come here. Today I had the, the good fortune of, uh, of uh, having a darshan at uh, the temple itself and then visiting Parashara Gurukulam. Uh, I don't know how many people have had the opportunity to visit uh, that particular institution. Uh, it's relatively fledgling and nascent, but I would request as many people as possible to pay a visit. Uh, I think it's one of those pristine enclaves of pure dharma. Uh, which uh, one would certainly love to be a part of. I wish I had received that kind of training as a child. And uh, I envy everyone who is getting a training as part of this particular institution. If I'm not wrong, please correct me if, if, I'm, if, if my pronunciation is wrong. I think it's situated about 15 kilometers away from Mysore on KRS Road at Belagola. So please try and make it a point to visit the place. And I would urge as many people as possible to support this particular institution. Uh, the, the Veda chants by youngsters 
perhaps uh, some of them under the age of 10, and some perhaps in their 15s and their teens, is amazing, and I think it's a fantastic start to the day. Three, uh, I thank Sri Yaduvir for taking time out of his schedule, for being a part of this particular occasion, and I think I couldn't have asked for a better chief guest simply because here there is a person who represents the legacy of this particular state, and given his age, <laughs> when most people expect people of this particular age, so to speak, to actually give up their identity and their traditions, here's a person who is a proud bearer of the traditions of this particular state, not just the city. So congratulations for doing a fantastic job. And uh, having had the benefit of meeting the members of the royal family in the morning today, uh, I'm astounded by their humility. And this is not the first royal family whose humility has floored me completely. There is something about Dharmic royal families, especially from the South, not to be biased about the South, but especially from the South, there's something about them which, uh, which tells you that humility is something that goes hand in hand with Dharmic traditions. The other family that I've had the benefit of engaging, uh, uh, let's say, uh, fairly closely with is the Travancore royal family as part of my cogitations during the Padmanabha Swami temple case. And I've had the benefit of receiving their affection as well and of being, uh, let's say, of having darshan of Sri Ananta Padmanabha Swami. Uh, that, that deity in itself is a different world altogether. Anybody who stands about five feet away from the particular deity is transported to a different place altogether. So I've had the benefit of, of engaging with that particular family and now this family. And there is something about dharma and humility that is inseparable. Notwithstanding how much ever you may have and whatever you think you may know, that there is a lot more to be done and there's a lot more to be known is something that they constantly reinforce over and over again. And that's been my learning. Uh, if anything, as, as, as far as this particular book is concerned, uh, as opposed to the book showcasing what I know, it has actually been a fantastic journey in what I did not know and how much more there is to know. And I hope through the course of the trilogy, in addition to, let's say, peeling away layers of my own ignorance as far as Bharat's culture and its history is concerned. I also take the readers along as part of this particular journey, especially the ones who come from my generation, because I think this generation and the subsequent generations are in dire need of help. And perhaps, rightly so, it would help if this particular help comes from someone they are in a position to relate to in terms of age. And because uh, then that gives them the confidence that if this particular person can do what he has or she has, living in almost similar circumstances and engaging with the same kind of peer pressure, why is it that we can't? I think that's extremely important for, uh, for, these, for this particular generation to understand. Now, as far as the book is concerned, uh, not to uh, claim credit for anything that has been said by the Prime Minister over the last two days, but I'm finding it very, very difficult to dismiss the fact that the talk about coloniality has started finding a significant degree of resonance in several quarters. So let's start with the first uh, statement that was made by the current Chief Justice of India, Sri N. V. Ramana, uh, perhaps in September, just before my book launch in Hyderabad, which was on 19th of September, just a day before. He made the statement that the Indian legal system is in dire need of Indianization and decolonialization. That was followed by a statement made by uh, the newly elevated uh, Supreme Court Judge Sri P. S. Narsimha, who made the same statement that perhaps it's time to revisit several of our judgments which suffer from coloniality. And then on the occasion of the Constitution Day, the Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi makes the statement that the colonial mindset continues to plague our systems and how it is the colonial mindset that is hindering the development of this country both from within and outside. And therefore I believe that these statements uh, establish the relevance of the book. And I don't say this because I have written it. I simply say this because it, established the, it, it establishes the relevance of the idea itself. So this is more about the message than the messenger, which is to say that if this particular window of history is not utilized by this particular generation and the entire society, which includes the state as well, to remove the cobwebs and layers of coloniality which affect our mindset, 
I can't think of a better time window again. And most importantly, if you don't do it now, from here you go downhill, because as much as there is enough, let's say, cause for hope and positivity, there is enough cause for despair as well. When you read the headlines on a daily basis, the kind of discussions that happen on campuses, the kind of so-called uh, protests that campuses seem to be germinating on a regular basis, the kind of fertile grounds that they have become for anti-Bharat activities. I think, therefore, not only is this the right time, it is the most critical juncture because I think Bharat is at a crossroads, is at a significant crossroads. Perhaps since the invasion of the Arabs in the 8th century, 711 CE, this is perhaps the most critical juncture facing Bharat. And I say this without any attempt at hyperbole or exaggeration. Because Bharat, as an independent country, notwithstanding the cloud that it enjoys, is beset with a lot of challenges, both from within and outside. And this is perhaps a, a huge realization that has dawned upon the society at a time when it is helmed by a government which has received a thumping mandate twice. And perhaps the, the fact that this particular government is at the helm couldn't have come at a better time because then one is forced to ask the question, if this particular government hadn't come to power, then what exactly would we have seen in terms of the course of Bharatiya history from 2014 to 2021, if 2004 to 2014 is anything to go by. Most people who understand the seriousness of that particular decade see it as the lost decade. I call it the lost century. And that would have repeated. If this comes across as a political statement, so be it. I can't think of a single individual in this country who is, who is not political at all. It's OK. <laughs> Doesn't make a difference. It's not about whether you're political or not. It's, it's a question of whether you're at least open about your views and can you defend those positions. It doesn't make a difference whether you are neutral because I don't think there's an age of neutrality currently, if at all it existed at any point of time in history. The age of neutrality does not exist anymore. Nobody is neutral, period. And anybody who sits on the fence is doing so out of cowardice or simply because of lack of interest, period. So, Either of these two categories, according to me, is dangerous for the future because that means these are wind socks which will blow according to the wind. And which means these are not to be people, uh, these are not people to be trusted with any kind of decisions which are based on principle, ideology, conviction, what is right, what is wrong. It is going to be a decision that is based on convenience and opportunism. Such people, whether they exist or not, whether their support counts or not, really doesn't make a difference to me. So I might as well take a very clear position. Second, Having said this, the one thing that I was very, very clear about when I started writing the book is to not make this book the mouthpiece of any particular organization. The book, even if I say so myself, is as apolitical as it can get because it is fundamentally civilizational and it looks well beyond politics. It looks well beyond the day-to-day -day ebb and tide of politics and says, no, you have to have a long-term vision as far as Bharat is concerned. Because only then you'll be able to plan for the challenges of today as well as tomorrow, which are significantly caused by the legacy of the past. And therefore, one of the things that I've tried to identify in the book is that the constant debate on social media about the left and the right and this party and that party is still myopic because regardless of whether you call yourself the left or the right, these are terms and mindsets which have been imported from the outside. So while you may think that you're not on the left and you're on the right, the fact of the matter is your thought process is still not Indic, it is still not Dharmic, it is still not Bharatiya. Therefore, the existence of an alien consciousness in the mind is not something which one particular section of the society is exclusively afflicted by. All of us are, by and large, regardless of what we call ourselves in terms of the labels that we give ourselves. I come from this end of the ideological spectrum. I come from that end of the political spectrum. It doesn't make a difference, especially on critical matters relating to Bharat's history. 
most of us seem to be having the same opinions when it comes down to brass tacks and asking questions. What do you think about caste? What do you think about religion? What do you think about a certain community? What do you think about temple control? What do you think about these issues? I don't see too much of a difference between the left and the right, largely speaking. Therefore, one of the things that I've tried to do in the book is to address certain fundamental questions, keeping all these political labels aside. So my book is first of all not meant for a particular eco chamber. I want as many people as possible to read it, not because I want more sales, but because I believe that the wider section of the audience, regardless of its labels, is afflicted by this particular problem. Second, I'm going to make a slightly provocative statement. Just bear with me for a moment. I have given up on the left completely on their ability to reform or recover. Impossible. I have zero expectations from them. So I am not going to waste a single breath of mine whining about them anymore. The constant uh, urge to expose them on social media. Hey, liberals, what is your position now? Are you, they've already said their position. Why do you keep asking them for their position? I don't understand the sense behind it. It's almost as if you're dying for their validation. Or you're hoping that they will admit their hypocrisy. Someday they'll grow a conscience and a brain. And they'll say, yes, I was wrong. In which case, I don't know if I should doubt their intellectual capacity or ours. <laughs> so therefore, my book is less about them and is less directed at them. But more about those people who believe that they're on the non-left. To tell them, okay, you believe you're on the non-left. Now let us test whether your views fundamentally are so different from them. And most importantly, whether the source of your views are Bharati or from the outside. I'll give you an example. Go on, I mean, just do a random survey on Twitter. You'll find a lot of people from the non-left saying, I'm conservative. I'm right. I'm nationalist. Where do these words come from? You call yourself Bharatiya. You call yourself as someone who is proud of your Indic roots. Please tell me which school of Indian philosophy these three terms or these thought processes come from. I'd like to understand. I'm going to draw a lot of blank stares when I ask this question. Because then you'll be forced to admit that there's a problem with the non-left in the first place. And then we'll talk about everybody else. So as someone uh, characterized this book, it's a blue-colored red pill. <laughs> Basically to tell people, let us first come out of what we believe is the right view. And the more we hug this word called the right wing, the right wing, the right wing, you are hugging the problematic history of the global right wing and putting your position and the dharmic position in that nasty genocidal basket. So don't do it. There is a much better tradition that we can draw from. And the fact that you're not able to draw from the tradition is proof of our ignorance with respect to what those traditions stand for. And what do they translate to with respect to contemporary situations. So you've still not been able to find an Indic or Dharmic label for your positions. And therefore, it's like, let's say, finding a vacant seat on a crowded bus. This is the only spot available. Left to gaya, to sir right baki hai, to sir bad jao. As opposed to applying an original filter to these issues. So this has been as much an exercise in my own, let's say, in exposing my own ignorance. And those of people who I felt are coming from the same side. So let's call this. Uh, an intervention for this particular site to say the day the non-left in this country elevates the scope of its discussions and starts drawing from Bharatiya philosophies, it would be in a much better position to pontificate to the left. Until then, it is a mere ego battle that is being fought on social media, on Facebook and Twitter to win brownie points, to say I am better, this party is better. You have not been able to go beyond the party or an organization. You have not been able to look at a particular position. 
So that has been the central idea behind this particular book. Now with this Sandarbh in mind, I will end my limited pravachan and open the floor for discussions. Throw whatever you want at me. I will answer to the best of my abilities. Let this be an out and out interactive session. The floor is yours. I've been given the, uh, the benefit of sitting and answering, but I'm typically better when I sta stand and answer during the Q&A session. You'll enjoy it even better, so wait. <laughs> Please go on. Yes. Exactly the point. The lawyer needs to stand. The energy needs to come out. Good evening. Good evening, sir. My pronouns to His Highness, Vasudev Bhatt, and to you. <clears throat> Basically, I want to ask a question that you you have been doing an excellent job on educating us on Indic civilization. Would it be, in your knowledge probably you must have thought about it, to develop a team of legal minds across the country, every city, every town and every village, to take on this task for every issue at local levels so that the Indic culture is established more strongly? Hopefully you can help. So. Uh, thank you for the suggestion. The thing is, thanks to the number of talks that I have done and especially this book, I think uh, a certain misconception has been cemented which is to say that I do this full time. This is less than 20% of my time and I do this as part of my pro bono commitments which is to say every lawyer is expected to earmark about 15 to 20% of his time doing stuff not for money. Most people, because I've said this before, in the legal fraternity, follow the rule of the Indian traffic, which is to say, keep left, okay? Therefore, they go to their favorite causes, okay. human rights, civil liberties, gender studies, that's what they go to. I have decided to use my time for dharmic causes openly and clearly. So therefore, all these cogitations and whatever I do is part of that 20%. I do not have the bandwidth to do beyond this simply because, um, how do I put it? Uh, I'm, I, I, I love my profession too much. I chose law for a very particular reason. Apart from the fact that I love the profession, it also gives me the ability to hold forth on some of these subjects with a certain degree of information. And therefore, I don't want to lose or dilute those skills which are central to me and which define me. Therefore, the legal skills is, I mean, the knowledge of the law and its application and legal logic is what I bring to the table. The more you generalize your skill sets, the less valuable you become and the less useful you are in the long run. So therefore, I don't wish to dilute those skills. However, not to take away from the suggestion that you've made, the good news is, fortunately, thanks to the social media positional advantage that I enjoy, I have seen a lot of committed individuals and lawyers take up these causes on their own in different parts of the country, which is exactly what the uh, idea was when I set out to support these initiatives, that to show that it's possible to maintain a decent balance between your regular work and your life and your commitment to dharma. And that what I'm doing is not extraordinary, it is merely planned and calculated. And the only sacrifice that I have to make is the time that is spent on partying and any other useless socializing, which I'm more than happy to give up because I'm have, I have zero interest in it. I'm positively antisocial on that front. So that is the only sacrifice that I've had to make and it's not a sacrifice. I enjoy having made that sacrifice. It's completely useless and especially in the daily circuit, I have zero interest. So once you are able to establish that this is feasible, workable, and this does not require you to be a bitter, poor martyr, which nobody in this generation wants to be, and rightly so, why should you be? Then it gives them the incentive to start thinking on these lines as to how do I combine my professional skill sets with my commitment to the civilization cause without sacrificing on my aspirations of a decent lifestyle and also leaving a legacy behind of having done something meaningful. That's basically the the entire format. And once this message goes loud and clear, the hope is that I will have more people to network. Because the point is, you have to see, you have to understand this. 
um, you don't expect any lawyer worth his salt and let's say worth his acumen to actually just jump into dharmic causes without an incentive that's not happening and if you think the people on the other side are working for ideology alone no money is being thrown at them some of them may not even be interested in the ideological cause of the other side they are only interested in the fact that a career path has been provided for them and somebody is grooming them and mentoring them period so if you're in a position to provide money those guys will jump on this side that's how it works in most professions so the assumption that 100 out of 100 people on the other side are all ideologically driven is stupid it's foolish i'd say it's typically the 80 20 rule 20 percent are ideologically driven rest of the 80 follow these 20 people because those 20 people represent a success story so to speak and therefore they're following them in one way or the other so you need to be able to create that 20 percent on this side provide certain success stories and then hope the others follow that's how it works but on a more tangible note on a more practical note i operate with two very clear realizations i am good at what i do and i don't need to be humble about it but i also know one thing about the about uh, let's say this the magnitude of this cause that i can't do everything on my own impossible and you shouldn't be it's too huge a task for any one particular person to operate with a, a messiah complex or a savior complex that i am the avatar purush who has come to actually do all of this not happening sorry you're dealing with legacy issues of 1400 years so there is a lot more to be done and you need a critical mass of people working on this so therefore wherever possible and wherever i find a decent blend of competence first and commitment to the cause later and when both these come together and there's a happy marriage between these two skill sets i have collaborated with such people so for instance give, let me give you a live example so about 36 christians were found to be occupying positions in tirumala tirupati devasthanam and we asked ourselves how on earth is this happening so when this issue came about now this is an issue that relates to a temple in the south i am sitting in delhi practicing in delhi and i don't want to make the mistake of delhi based establishments which is to assume that what is good for delhi is good for the rest of the country okay and therefore i delegated that particular issue to a local legal team with a decent supervision because the assumption is if it traverses from the local courts and comes to the supreme court i need to know what is the journey that it has traversed therefore i need to have an oversight of it but a local legal team which is a competent law firm is handling it very very clearly similarly in madras high court odisha bombay wherever possible we have done this and uh, a good number of these legal teams have volunteered to offer their services pro bono themselves that is the importance of having a very clear let's say model to emulate in terms of a workable model so when someone assumes that I am sacrificing something, I'm sorry, I have not sacrificed on my lifestyle, I will not. I have not sacrificed on my financial opportunities in terms of my practice and I will not. Because that is what gives me the ability to do everything else. What is the first rule that they tell you when you sit in a flight? Protect yourself first <laughs> and then you can offer the oxygen mask to somebody else. It's exactly what I'm doing. Okay? You have to be realistic about these things. So once you're clear about this, then it becomes easier for you to understand, okay, within this limited, let's say, framework, how much can you do, how much can you push? So to answer your question, there are more ways to do this, and it is happening. It's a slightly slow process because you have to understand that more than anything else, most people are worried about the reactions in their own peer fraternities. Oh, I'm going to be branded this and that and all that. But when they realize that there's an incentive to being branded like that, they'll jump. <laughs> So I'm merely creating an incentive to be branded like this. Yes, so what? Of course I am this. So what? What's your problem? Diversity, free speech. It's a two-way street. I too will use it. Constitution is a two-way street. I too will use it, period. So once you take away the stigma associated with a certain position, you will find more talent gravitating towards that particular position. So the entire idea has been to take away the stigma associated with this particular position on campuses, in office spaces, on social media and other places. But through information, not plain and simple rhetorical debating on a regular basis. So that I think over the last few years has been achieved to a significant extent. And the book tour has effectively opened my eyes to the fact that the work is having an impact. And when I say this, I'm not talking about my work alone because it's a team that's working. 
So whenever I say this, I will not take credit for anything as a solo act. Whatever has been achieved so far on any of these dharmic causes, little or more that history will decide, but whatever has been achieved so far is the product of a teamwork, very clear teamwork. People knowing what they're good at and what they're not good at and where they're supposed to give space to others. So that model is something that we're trying to achieve. Second, the standard assumption is the left is more united, the non-left pulls each other down like crabs. That's a statement that you hear over and over again. And therefore a model had to be established saying who will do what and why. Is it to be rationalized on the basis of hierarchy or will it be rationalized on the basis of skill sets and competence, period. Once you're able to address these issues on the basis of skill set and competence, it's easier to remove ego outside the equation. You can just pluck it out and say, that's irrelevant. Be more objective about what you can and what you can't. So there are a lot of soft and hard issues involved in this, but so far I think the movement has been decent and you will see and hear more such voices coming about. And under no circumstances, my team or I wish to monopolize this cause under any circumstances because it's too much for us to handle and it's not possible. Because you have to realize that as much as you think you're in it for credit, if something goes wrong, you're also going to get the flack immediately on social media. Indian cricket team gets it, why, why will I not get it? Okay, so it's a, it's, 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 it has, it's a coin with two sides. So therefore, the realistic working model has been Bite what you can chew, only sign those checks which can be cashed, period. Next. Uh, my question is uh, specific to uh, the Chamundi temple. Yes, please, yes. Uh, we have uh, the instrument of accession, then the constitution of India, then the rights of the shibaitship of uh, the, the, the princely kings, and the rights of the deity. So in this context, for a private temple, for a private temple like the Chamundi Hill, which was the the deity worshipped by the the Wadiyars, uh, the presence of the state in these temples and the control of uh, the Muzrai Ilake or the Muzrai Department, uh, what is what is it that you know the, the position stands as far as the government is in control and uh, the the rights of uh, the worship and the deity rights? If you can elaborate, uh, we'll be happy to know. So, with Sri Yadavir being present here, I'll take the liberty of uh, disclosing just one aspect. I will be getting into this particular issue in my legal mode shortly. And therefore, common sense dictates that I don't speak on this beyond this. <laughs> Whatever has to happen, will happen in the right place. So wait for it. The, if you are looking at a, a model or a template which is comparable to this particular temple, although not one-to-one -one correspondence, just consider reading the judgment with respect to the Padmanabha Swami temple case. Beyond that, I don't wish to say anything because I can say it for the sake of publicity, but it will come at the expense of legal strategy and court craft. So allow me to maintain my silence on the subject. Right, next. Yes. Uh, first of all... Ma'am, if you don't mind. Yes. I've been a last venture all my life, and my last ventures are not getting a chance. Sure, we'll finish that and come to you. Right? Yes. Yeah. Namaste, His Highness. And, uh, hi, Saidi Pukchi. Please. So my question to you is, I mean, firstly, thanks for, uh, you know, starting a fire of decoloniality. But for, for me, uh, decoloniality, what will be the end state of it? What will the, be the institutions? I mean, how will the institutions look like? Mm. How will the judiciary look like? Mm. I mean, at the end of this whole project, what is it that we, uh, that we'll be looking at in the okay. whole picture? I don't have an answer to that question in terms of the specifics because my own analysis is incomplete and it's work in progress. I will tell you what I'm clear about so far. That there is a problem of coloniality and the decoloniality is the solution. These are the two crystal clear conclusions that I have arrived at in my own headspace. 
what will it translate to in terms of the nature of the state, the organization of institutions, the relationship between the temple and the state, individual rights, gender rights, all these issues. I will be in a much better position to formulate after I'm done with the trilogy. And there's a good reason for this, and I'll explain why. My analysis of the Constitution and its colonial consciousness is far from complete. I still don't have a clear answer as to whether the document is fully colonial or fully decolonial, or is it a mixed bag? If it is a mixed bag, is it 70-30 in our favor or against us? I don't have an answer to that yet. And since I'm taking this up as a very serious scholarly pursuit, not to give myself the tag of a scholar, but to say that I want to be rigorous about this, I haven't decided the outcome and then pushing my evidence in that particular direction. I haven't done that yet. I have kept an open mind to what the literature may educate me as I go through it. So I will be in a much better position to answer this question. And I, I repeat, much better position to answer this question as opposed to saying I'll have the correct answer to this question. I'll be in a much better position to answer this question after the trilogy. So just by way of a, a spoiler, a bit of a spoiler, is that what I thought will be the timeline of the second book. I've started working on the second book uh, to a significant extent, and I've altered it because there are portions which I want this generation to know of Bharat's history. Because once they read it, they will be able to draw parallels between what is happening in this country in several parts and what happened barely 70 or 80 years ago and how history is being repeated in less than a century. That is the worst part about Bharat's history currently. That history is being repeated in less than a century, or at best within 120 years. Usually that doesn't happen. It takes time for history to repeat itself. But in, the, in, in Bharat's case, it's happening. And therefore, I want to introduce that literature with a certain sense of urgency, saying, please read this. The academic, uh, let's say, notion that you constantly wallow in is at loggerheads with existential challenges that this particular civilization faces. It's almost as if the house is on fire, and you're asking, fire kaise shuru hua, as opposed to throwing water at it. Okay? And you decide to fiddle, like Nero. So the point is, I am trying to put out that fire first with, let's say, a carpet bombing of information, with facts saying, please read this, and whatever nonsense that you consume from different uh, portals and drags that is at loggerheads with what actually history says. And I'm trying to discuss history, which is in the 1900s, because that is much more relatable to the generation currently. If I were to discuss history of the 1500s and 1600s, you'll see, this is very old, what on earth? Which is why I'm using that period of history along with the Constitution to make it extremely relevant so that the realization is that this is not an academic discussion. This is not an academic pursuit. It's a crack of a whip asking people to wake up. So wait for the third part to come out, which should hopefully be in June 2023. And I promise I will answer the question because that is what I am trying to answer myself as well. That's exactly what I've asked at the outset in the first book, saying, what are we looking at? I will answer the question then. OK, next. We'll come back to this lady, then we'll come there. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, first, thank you so much for writing your book. I have a comment and then a question. Yes, ma'am. My comment is that you said you've given up on the left, and I see where you're coming from. But I don't think we sh as a professor, I don't think we should give up on left-leaning youngsters. Agreed. And in particular, the non-left and all of us members of the audience who are non-left should find better ways to engage with them. Fair enough. Um, on that note, I think you've really done a great job of getting youngsters to move away from binge watching uh, Game of Thrones to binge watching your lectures. <laughs> um, so my question to you is, how do we translate this momentum into something bigger? And how do we, you know, go from being, uh, you know, go to being a democracy that's for dharma, of dharma, and by dharma? So you've spoken about freeing Hindu temples, truthifying history, and all of these are policy changes. They take time, they're slow. Correct, correct. What can we who are sitting here who believe in the cause, what can we do? Do you have any suggestions? Very clear suggestions, which I uh, offered to a 10-year-old in uh, California two years ago. And I'll explain why it's very, very critical. 
start with, I think, three or four aspects. Since I've benefited from these suggestions, I'm in some position to say this with confidence. But before that, I completely agree with your first point. I am not giving up on the youngsters on the left. And when I mean the left, I mean hardened, incorrigible, insufferable left, which takes a certain degree of entrenchment of position, which comes with age, right? You're beyond 30 or beyond 35, and you have decided to invest your ego into this particular issue as opposed to your mind. Then that's a person I have no interest in dealing with. That's a person I'm interested in pummeling in an argument, not convincing him. I don't wish to convince you or persuade you. I will only defeat you in an argument, period. 100%. <laughs> there is no point in trying to convince such people. You only tell them, you understand only this language. It's either here or there. Come here, we will talk, period. But you have to engage with the youngsters, 100%, because it's a, such a huge demographic. And from the point of view of the fact that this demographic is so vulnerable, especially through the education system, you cannot afford to give up on them. So I'm with you. Coming to the realistic suggestions. Put yourself in the shoes of a person who has a workaday life and who does not have the ability to pursue big time causes at the macro level. What can that person do? Basic issues. One, what is it that I've started with in the book? Language, semantics, linguistics. So learn your mother tongue at the very least. Equip yourself with knowledge of your own literature in the very at the very least. I've given this unpopular example before. I don't think I don't see why it should be unpopular. In fact, it's a backhanded compliment, so I'll repeat it. I challenge anyone to speak in Kannada with the same fluency as Asaduddin Ovesi speaks in Urdu. If you can't, he is doing something right which you aren't. Period. So start with the language. That's one. Second, I'm making the point that if you're not in a position to contribute to the, uh, the free temple movement at the macro policy level, what is it that you can do? Two things. In fact, three things. I want to be able to see that a person walking on the street is a Hindu which means whatever is the visible symbol must be there. It starts with that, 100%. <laughs> Why are visible symbols part of core tenets of other religions? Because it becomes a part of your habit, a part of your second nature, and you will not think and, and talk about your religion at, let's say, at some esoteric level as if you're talking of a third party. You won't talk of it as if it's a stranger. You need to be able to connect with it. And therefore, without practice, there is no logic. And without logic, there's no practice. Both have to go hand in hand. You need to know what is it that you're fighting for on social media. And if you don't even practice it on a daily basis in the simplest of forms, what on earth are you fighting for? I don't even understand. Makes no sense. Then you're not fighting for the cause. You're fighting for your ego investment in the cause, which is to say, I want to prove that I'm right on a particular topic, as opposed to saying I'm supporting something that is right. Okay. So a visible symbol is necessary. Third, the corollary from there is that take ownership of at least the local temples. Why is everybody sitting in some remote part of the country and constantly thinking of Jagannath Puri and Tirupati, but not the local temple? Is this temple under any less state control compared to Tirupati? No, it's not. This is the temple which shouldn't be under state control because if at all there are some policy justifications for the state being present in a macro institution, in a mega institution, which could have security issues, what is its justification for being at, in the street temple? I don't understand. What money are they going to make? What corruption are you talking about and who are you to talk about corruption? You have no moral authority. The Indian state has never had moral authority to speak on corruption in the last 70 years. So who are you to talk about corruption? At least if it's corrupt, it's someone from my community eating it as opposed to you taking money and giving it to some other community. <laughs> so I am clear about the fact that it starts with this, then you go to the next level, which is what? Do not reduce any of your festivals to mere celebratory activities. Explain the significance. Do something about it. None of this is going to be possible because at the end of the day, when it's a nuclear family and the joint family system is broken, then what is it that you're looking at? So what is human psychology at play here? 
it is the joint family that provides an extended support system that has been done away with now, thanks to our own insistence on nuclear families. Somehow that was meant to be the progressive way, done. Okay, kya progress we will see. Second, if this setup is gone, then you still need to have some connection with a larger ecosystem which reinforces your identity. And therefore, go back to your basic sampradayas. I can't think of most Hindu families which have not had a traditional guru or a traditional matha or a traditional institution that they've been connected with in one way or the other. To me, it doesn't make a difference whether it's Brahminical or non-Brahminical. It honestly doesn't make a difference. As long as it's a traditional sampradaya, it's a traditional sampradaya. For me, traditional is not Brahminical. Traditional is Hindu, period. Therefore, go back to those institutions. Two things come out of it. You don't feel alone when you're trying to bring up a young child and trying to instill values in it, and when you don't know how is this child going to deal with the rest of the world, is he going to be or is she going to be the misfit? But when you realize that there are others, that fear comes down to a significant extent. And you also end up strengthening that particular institution because such institutions survive on following patronage and numbers. And when the heads of such institutions are in a position to command greater respect from their following, they will be in a much better position to talk to the politicians saying, you can keep playing politics, but don't keep playing politics with our institutions. Because they will derive confidence from the fact that their people are backing them. That is what, let's say, the, the so-called godmen of other institutions and other faith systems bank on. The existence of a ground support base. Tell me which of these things that I've just suggested is beyond the realm of reasonableness and practicability. I don't think it is. These are plain and simple basics. Once you're in a position to achieve this, the immediate effect that you're looking at is an enhanced attachment to your culture and a better awareness of your own institutions. So the next time when someone says, it is in your institutions, there, are, there is more corruption, not in our institutions, you can actually tell them, what are you talking about? Our institutions are corrupt today largely because of entrenchment of the state. That is a fact. Because the state has an incentive to constantly attract crowds at the expense of dharma, tradition, sampradaya, ritual, practice, whatever. And therefore, they will do whatever it takes to create revenue streams, ports of revenue. For them, these institutions are nothing but ports of revenue. That's it. Therefore, you'll be in a much better position to argue. Nothing that I have said in the last five and a half years, ever since I started speaking on the subject in September 2016, is beyond... It's, it's not something that requires a 120 plus IQ or 160 plus IQ. It's plain and simple logic based on the ground realities. If there is a payment-based darshan queue system, who benefits from this? First, the person who controls the affairs of the institution benefits from this. Who is the person who's controlling the secular aspects, which is to say the monetary and fiscal aspects of the institution? It is the state. So why is my community taking the rap on its knuckle when the state should be held responsible for this? Why is my community, my faith, and my institution being constantly called a commercial institution when it is the state that is responsible for this? And it's constantly my community that is the favorite whipping boy of everyone who says Hinduism is all about money. Wherever you go, it's all about money. Is that the case? If that is the case, it is in other faith systems that there is a systematic, organic way of collecting money on a monthly basis. 10% has to be given, whether it's a church or a mosque. It's not my uh, temple that's doing this from everyone. Right? So that takes us to the next step. There, there is an obligation and a top-down imposition. I am saying, those who are serious about this, park 10% of your revenue. Use it to support the causes which you believe are advancing the cause of dharma. If you cannot be a Rana Pratap, at least be a Bhamasha is something that I've said umpteen number of times. So if you cannot be in the line of fire, at least support those who are in the line of fire in one way or the other. And therefore, monetary support is the most important way of doing that. So 10 to 15% of your income does not belong to you, is your self-imposed restraint. Do that. Five. Very, very dangerous suggestion. Hinduism is not a pacifist religion. Hinduism is not a religion of cowards. Hinduism does not fear force. Therefore, 
revival of the kshatra spirit is critical 100% critical if you constantly think of it as the dirty job then all you're going to be left with is a small island surrounded by a gutter let's see who's going to do the dirty job then the state under any government cannot do this and certainly cannot do this efficiently which means the Hindu community must slowly start looking at self-sufficient enclaves which are equipped to protect themselves several states in this country have already shown that the existence of the state apparatus is not an advantage it has actually turned to be a liability for Hindus when they want to protect themselves so do not use the Gita to teach pacifism to your kids teach the Gita to teach Kshatra to your kids the Gita is not meant to be a post retirement Katha Kalakshepam book <laughs> where people get together for satsangas and test each other's memories do you need the shloka do you know that shloka oh, oh that goes on is that what it was meant for Hare, what have you understood man so grasp the saransh and apply all of these are doable none of these require state support none of the things that I've said so far require state support now despite this if you don't wish to do it well you have just signed away your destiny as a civilization then Ram Nam Satya hai. <laughs> next Namaste. Yes. I appreciate your point uh, when you told that uh, uh, a person who is leaning towards no party, uh, the same way a uh, famous uh, scholar and poet uh, of Karnataka DVG says, Pakshatita Rashtraka, you also mentioned that leaning towards right will make us fall into the problems of global left. Global I agree right. largely. Global in the, right. Gro global li right yes. sorry right. in the same way will we not fall uh, uh, by following this decolonial principles will we not fall to the problems of the global decoloniality where is that border line okay fantastic question and this question has been asked of me twice and I've responded five times so let me repeat it once more decoloniality does not have one global template which means the solution is local and contextual therefore decoloniality starts with the basic presumption that if you remove the colonial filter from your head you will be able to access your past without hindrance and the collective civilizational forced amnesia that all of you have been put through and all of us have been put through we will come out of it you will literally be the neo who's pulled out the plug and woken up in the tub in the matrix after that what you do is your call and your choice as a culture as a society I have not subscribed to any abstract universal definitions of what should be a decolonial approach for every society. What have I said in this case? Coloniality has translated to the following uh, issues in my society. Fissures have been created and fault lines have been created on the basis of caste. Fissures have been created on the basis of language. A false sense of patriarchy has been imposed on me through an Abrahamic experience and therefore I am being told that even this society needs the very same brand of feminism as the West as opposed to saying Bharat has its own response with respect to feminism and the divine feminine okay having identified these problems I am basically making the statement that the solution then lies in your own culture to a significant extent the past may not hold the answers to everything but the past certainly has some lessons to draw from so you don't have to worry about us making the same mistakes as everybody else because frankly speaking no document or nothing on paper is the reason 
for you not going back to untouchability. It's your own moral compass as a society which, you've, which, which has taken the decision this is not right. Because that happened much before the abolition of untouchability under Article 17 of the Constitution. This movement started in 1930s itself. So put some faith in the moral character of your community that itself calls for decoloniality because the colonial notion is that Hindus are depraved and characterless and constantly need the stick in order to be, let's say, governed. Whereas the decolonial thought says, this is a society that believes in the concept of dharma and duty. Give them that respect and the society will respond and reward. Don't treat them like animals who require a top-down imposition. Treat them as individuals and a society uh, deserving of dignity and you will see how they respond to it. The character of the Indian state under the British man and the, let's say, the post-British uh, uh, brown man hasn't changed much because both of them believe that this population can be controlled only with the stick without realizing that this population has always been so huge and still it has managed to survive because it has put faith in the concept of dharma, duty, honor codes, ethics, not law. Honor codes and ethics, which are much more powerful than the law because then there is societal obligation. Saying if you do not subscribe to this honor code, you're not just bringing dishonor to yourself, but also to us as a kula. That's exactly how that net functioned. That there is a social pressure on you to act decently and to live up to your obligations. So decoloniality will translate to you looking for solutions on those lines. Next. Good evening, everybody. I am Dr. Anil Thomas. My question is from 2014. Hmm. I've been waiting that my country's name, India, hmm. would be changed to Bharat right. to feel more Bharatiya. Right. What is your take on that? Even I don't know, sir. <laughs> we are changing names of roads, but not names of the country. <laughs> We are changing names of cities, but not name of the country. So apparently some Mughal road has been changed to Maharaja Agrasen road in Agra and other places that has recently happened. We are doing all of this. Then change the name of the country. I'm with you. Please ask this question. I will join the chorus. I am completely with you on this point. And when someone tells me, naam mein kya rakha hai, Arvind ko hata ke Akbar rakh do, dekh lete hain. Tell me it doesn't make a difference. Of course it makes a difference. It starts with the name. What are you talking about? Why do people name? Why do people think so much behind naming a child? Are they idiots? Because name has a certain vibration. It has a certain energy. That's our belief. That's our philosophy. So if you're telling me that the name has no value, then you don't understand the power of sound. And this is a society and a culture that believes in the rich power of sound. What are you talking about? So it starts with the name, 100%. I'm with you. I'm completely with you. That's my answer. Next, there's a lady who's been waiting. Yes. Um, namaskaram, sir. Namaskaram. Looking at the recent, if we have to apply a dharmic lens mm. to the recent imposition and withdrawal of the farm bills, mm. what would that look like? And how are we supposed to look at these situations and situations that are going to come up in the future? as a new age Bharatiya or with the dharmic lens? I have been trolled on social media for my position on this. Why do you want me to go through that hell and nightmare once more? <laughs> so, <laughs> see, my point is this. One way of looking at this is to say that the government buckled under pressure. The other way of looking at it is the Prime Minister has risked his own personal capital in terms of his goodwill in the withdrawal. And if he's taken such a serious decision, perhaps there is something to it. That's one answer. He wouldn't have done this unless and until there was something else which is not visible to the public eye. That's one level of an answer. And therefore, it takes us to the very thorny issue of the revival of the Khalistani sentiment in Punjab and the law and order issues that perhaps the government was looking at if the situation were to continue or had it continued. My very limited observation 
because I don't want to use the word criticism and get into trouble, is that when 1.0 version of this, which is the Shaheen Bagh protest started, you were normalizing a certain form of occupation of our streets. You let that continue. And the only thing that successfully got those people out of their places is the Mahamari called Corona. Not anything else. And it's a sad testament that a pandemic or an epidemic had to do this, as opposed to the state doing it. And when I say the state, I also believe that perhaps the judiciary should not have indulged these sentiments beyond a point. I'm saying that as well. The second limb of the argument is, you've had one experience. Why are you allowing the second experience at a larger scale to start? So does this mean that with the right kind of faces and the right kind of occupations, this country can be occupied and anybody can have their way? Is that the message that is being sent? If yes, should we start adopting that particular approach for temple freedom and other issues? Is that the message? I don't know. Maybe that's the message, but still. My point is that I continue to believe that a government which enjoys such a popular mandate still should have put faith in its own support base, which stood by it after 370, which stood by it after CAA, which stood by it after the NRC of Assam. Despite all these protests, the silent majority has always supported you. And it is this silent majority that has given you this power. So put faith in these people as opposed to a bunch of stone pelters and stone throwers and, and anti-national protesters. I will also caveat this by saying I am not going to call every farmer who has participated in this protest an anti-national. Sorry, I can't do that. That would be too much of an argument to make. All I am saying is anyone who has allowed a separatist sentiment to enter and infiltrate this movement has jeopardized their own cause and has also put at risk Bharat's security by reviving a much more dangerous issue than Kashmir, uh, Kashmiri terrorism. Something that we struggled to put down and it was a bloody put down after several years, after a lot of effort. And the healing process has been significant and we have managed to bring it back and give it a certain degree of normalization. For me, the repealment of the farm laws is secondary but the normalization of the Khalistani sentiment is the primary problem. That is the only thing that I'm worried about. Because farm laws, farmers have lived in this country, they have survived under the worst of circumstances, they'll find a way. And since the repeal of the farm laws has not translated to a backlash from the farming community, maybe it shows that they still have some faith in the government, especially the Prime Minister himself. So I'm not willing to comment on that. All I'm saying is, I just hope that we are not looking at the revival of Pakistan's K2 policy, Kashmir and Khalistan. When that happens, coupled with what's happening on the Chinese border and multiple issues across the country, along with illegal migration, you're literally looking at India being sieged from within and outside. I just hope that we are in safe hands and I pray that is the case. Next. Namaste Mahodaya. Ji, yes. I am the first because I am the last pincher. <laughs> uh, uh, my hu Sheshadri Prathamika Shala Shikshakhu, Sarkari Prathamika Shala Shikshakhu. Ji, sir. Uh, Isliye my Mekale system ka ek vector hu, aur anevale PD ke liye Brahma bhi hu. Hmm. Bohot Mekale ko my utpadan karta hu. Any specific uh, suggestion from your side for implementing decolonization mindset? See, uh, one th specifically I say, mm -hmm. I skip usually Gandhi Jayantis. So, a notice was served on me for not attending the national festivals. Mm -hmm. Immediately, I answered with a Supreme Court order saying it is not mandatory right. uh, to attend national festivals. Join my profession, sir. <laughs> uh, so, any specific, uh, and also, usually I travel by 
uh, unreserved coaches, sorry, reserved coaches uh, without reservation. Okay. <laughs> yes, I fight with TTEs also. Because usually the bogies will be free, <laughs> but I am not allowed to sit. Uh, in such cases where there is, uh, my activity is not considered lawful, hmm. how should I react? Allow me to choose between the questions and I'll go with the question on uh, decoloniality in education, which you spoke of on the Macaulay issue. So uh, in my recent Pune talk on 17th of October, I happened to speak on this in some detail. All I've said is one of the challenges that you've been seeing with respect to education right from the Vajpayee dispensation has been that each time you try and change the curriculum and whatnot, you're being accused of bhagwa karan, saffronization, so on and so forth. So I think a fairly commonsensical suggestion, which is not my own, which others have made, is that why don't parents and students have diversity of options and more options in terms of what they want to study? So at the very least, create an alternative system so that those who wish to subscribe to a revised curriculum have that option as well. And those who don't, need not. As opposed to having one curriculum that's being imposed on everyone. From the sciences to the history to language and all these subjects, allow us to craft, let's say, an Indic knowledge system or an Indic education system and create a separate board, just as you have the ICAC and the CBSE, create a separate board so that it becomes one of the mainstream options and so that you have schools and educational investors moving in that particular direction. Jisko ye padna hai padhe, jisko wo padna hai padhe. I don't want to read Macaulay's version of my history. You don't want to read the Bhagwa version of your, uh, our history. Don't. Let history decide subsequently as to which of the two products are good for the country. At least let us have more options as opposed to everybody being sent to this mass produced factory. Right? That is one perhaps one solution. Because you see, typically most governments operate like water. They want the path of least resistance. Okay. Therefore, I'm saying this is the path of least resistance, wherein you're not taking away something from them and you're not imposing something on us, and vice versa, period. Second, you have to ask yourself a simple question. When in the opposition you opposed RTE significantly and the exceptions given to minority institutions and the RTE, you opposed it. Why haven't you acted on that opposition and acted on that belief in the last seven years? Which means either scrap the RTE or make it equally applicable to minority institutions. That hasn't happened. The reason why this becomes significantly important is the RT system has devastated non-minority schools because they have not got the kind of payouts and subsidies that they're supposed to get from the state out under the RT structure. In cities like Delhi and, and states like Delhi and other places, you're looking at thousands of schools being shut down because they're unable to run. So when you're looking at the education system, I'm looking at the hard infrastructure apart from the content which that infrastructure disseminates. So here is the fairly clear solution, at least workable solutions for both these subjects. And it's not the first time this is even being proposed. So I don't think it's a question of paucity of solutions. Perhaps it's a question of will, political will. When you come to power, what is it that you come to power for is a question you should be asking yourself. If it is an end in itself, then the more things change, the more things remain the same. But if it is merely a means to an end, what is the end goal? These are long-term civilizational changes. These are not small-time tweaks. You make this change, you will see less trouble on campuses and students being rebels without a cause on the streets in the next 10-15 years. But if you don't, and you shove woke culture more into our curriculum through manuals and whatnot, you are creating a future where even as a government, you do not have, an, uh, uh, let's say, an electoral incentive because this, these people won't vote, won't, uh, vote for you. I don't understand why do you continue to support them. The products of the system will never vote for you. Right? So I don't even see the political incentive in keeping this particular structure alive. 
forget civilizational incentive, forget everything else. I'm asking the political incentive. Is the political disincentive and disadvantage not clear to you? I leave it at that. So it's seven. How many more questions can yeah. we take? Uh, two more questions. Yes, two okay. more. Yes. yes. Excuse me, sir. Yes, ma'am. Um, regarding the constitution, we have only one constitution, hmm. isn't it, sir? So, uh, why can't we have only one law which is applicable to all Indians? Hmm. That is the uh, that is creating problem. The law itself is dividing. If we have two laws for uh, in the Indians, Hindu law is there, and for Mohammedans there is another law. Hmm. Why can't you have that? And uh, being an advocate yourself is an advocate. Why can't we fight for that? Uh, the law which is applicable to why <laughs> applicable to all uh, India uh, Indians Hindu law. It should be. I think uh, that is. Uh, uh, good, I think. Uh, instead of having nowhere in the world, we have two laws like this. Understood. Okay. Isn't it, sir? You're right. You're right. Hundred percent. Oh, that right. is my oh, I opinion. agree with you. So your point is, there should be only one law, which is Hindu law. I'm with you. Uh, when we have one right, constitution, right. Correct, one correct. Uh, law. Correct. Correct. So That's all. it is applicable. I think to the all. solution is straightforward. Uh, Let yeah. this government declare that this is a Hindu nation. After that, we can have a Hindu yeah, law. Yeah, that is true, sir. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's I am saying the government should do this. Yeah. Why should I go to court asking for this? How can I go to court in a writ petition asking for this? Oh, it won't make I sense. See, no, yes, I can't sir. do that. A government with 282 and then 303. And they are in a position to declare this. Let them do it. Baat khatam ho gaya. The solution itself is in this only, I think. Ma'am, I, I completely agree with you. The moment that you declare this, most of your problems are over. Yeah. Just make this one declaration. Over. The magic wand has been waved. It's over. I'm 100% telling you this. I think all of us should write to the center basically saying, please declare this country a Hindu nation. 100%. I mean this very, very seriously. Thank you. Thank you, sir. sir As opposed question. to hundreds of writ petitions in court, this one open letter is sufficient. Next. Sir, sir yes. this is regarding uh, two big institutions. One is the, um, the Dharmic ones and the other one are the Mats. Hmm. So what template is there where they can come out from their nutshells other than imparting to the particular caste so that most of the problem is solved and where the HR department can ensure a proper Bharat Mata Ki Jai ka textbook can come out one. And second big institution is the constitution. We don't know where this word secular was, who has put it and how do we have to get out of that. For the second one, read my book, I've addressed this. 100% have addressed this. Yeah. Okay. For the first one, mm, see, I, this is slightly problematic and I might as well make this point. Anyone who says that caste is the reason for lack of temple freedom and caste is the biggest problem because once the state comes out of uh, the temple, which caste will control which temple? And therefore, that is the reason that we are going through this question because since that question has not been answered, we cannot move towards a solution. I'm sorry, it's a fundamentally flawed question. And uh, let me just explain how. Those institutions which belong to a particular sampradaya will be governed by those sampradayas. And anybody else who wants access to that particular institution will respect the sentiments of that sampradaya and step into that particular institution, period. That's how it has always worked. Whether it is the Saiva sampradaya or the uh, Lingayat sampradaya or whatever it is, you are looking at people who call themselves as Hindus can step in, but the control and management will be in the hands of those people who actually are subscribers to that particular sampradaya and who are followers of that particular sampradaya. One. Second, unfortunately, we have come to a very reductive notion that sampradaya is equal to caste. No, it is not. In some places, sampradaya is equal to caste, where some varnas control certain institutions. But in a good number of these inst instances, Sampradaya is across Varnas. You need not be, let's say, a, a, a person from one particular Varna alone to be a part of the particular Sampradaya. Okay? Second, as long as the core rituals, or rather as long as the religious practices of that particular institution are entirely in the hands of those people who subscribe to that particular Sampradaya, 
you can have, let's say, a management system where perhaps others have some say in the management. However, to say that non-members of the sampradaya will equally have rights with respect to the religious affairs of one particular sampradaya is not done. And there's a good reason for this. You are fundamentally, as a dharmic system, a collection of various sampradayas. Therefore, every sampradaya decides to protect its traditions very, very fiercely. That's how, for them, Hinduism starts and ends with their sampradaya. So your idea cannot be that for the purposes of Hindu unity, I will create sampradaya complete, I'll destroy sampradayic identities completely. If you do that, you don't have a viable replacement also. Then what are you going to do with all the traditions that have come as part of this, all the vocations that have come as part of this, all the knowledge traditions that have come as part of this, you will kill everything. So this blunt James Bond hammer, let's say sledgehammer approach, which is to say Hindu unity is the goal and therefore caste is the problem. Destroy caste, destroy sampradaya, destroy diversity. Uske baad kya rahega Hinduism mein? What is left in Hinduism after that? You have created an Abrahamic equivalent of Hinduism, period. Your internal diversity has been killed. So I'm sorry, anybody who says that let us destroy all these identities for Hindu unity, unity is not created like this. Let me tell you how it is created. Christians and Muslims too have diversity in denominational identities within their religions, right? So why do you assume that they are united despite their diverse identities and you are not? Two reasons, two very good reasons. Unity is created also by defining who does not belong to your group. Therefore, they are very clear about who is a non-Muslim and who is a non-Christian. Whereas we are the ones constantly saying everybody is a Hindu. Everybody should be given access to our temples apparently. Even people who have broken our temples should be given access apparently without the need for an affidavit. Hmm? This is what we are saying. So the one thing that you have to learn from them is the identity and the clarity as to who is the outsider. A community is defined as much by its, uh, its identification of insiders as much by its identification of outsiders. Second. What rallies people around is not a vague idea of unity, but a specific cause. When Ram Janabhumi movement was going on, did people ask each other their castes and it contributed to the Karseva? No. Where was that happening? According to them, they were all fighting for a cause. Jati was irrelevant, Varna was irrelevant. So identify causes which bring people together as opposed to simply saying destroy the structure. If you do not have a replacement for an existing structure, you do not have any business destroying the existing structure. Because then you're creating anarchy. You're creating chaos. You're creating the absence of a social structure and a social net, a safety net. Logic and received wisdom and community psychology always tells you, do not destroy something until you have a viable alternative for what exists. Period. So as far as, let's say, temple freedom and HRC, all of this is concerned, let us be very clear that it is possible to retain sampradayic diversity and still ensure that everybody else has access to those institutions for spiritual solace and worship. And none of this should be given as an excuse to allow the government to stay inside temples, regardless of whichever party may be in power. Have that clarity. Don't make this a political uh, position, make this a religious, civilizational, cultural position, you will survive. Thank you. Is that it? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have heard for more than an hour from Sai Deepak Ji. Uh, he has given a lot of insights to us. And he is also acknowledge the royal family's humility and the dharma here. And few points which we have come out of this and uh, pointers here which have come out here is, first thing we have to unlearn what we have learned from the decolonial mindset. The, that is a need of the R. And second, let us follow our language, let us talk in our mother tongue. Then third one, let us start using the visible symbols that we are Hindus. And let us take the ownership of the temples. 
and not but not but uh, not last but the least uh, let us all strive for a hindu nation and call this bharat and let us also revive the kshatra kshatra spirit in every one of us thank you sai ji now let me finish with the oath of thanks on behalf of manthana i take this opportunity to thank his highness shri yaduvira krishnadatta chamaraj odiyar for his revered presence and releasing the book for you have taken time to be here despite your busy schedule it is very kind of you sir thank you i thank shri vasudev bhat who agreed to be here with us today sir thank you very much now i thank shri j sai deepak who agreed to be here come to mysore all the way from delhi despite his busy schedule who have become a source of inspiration to lot of people here thank you very much for writing such a wonderful book as this was the need of the hour i believe it will carve a place in every person's collection of books and reference guide to study bharat thank you sir i now like to thank vigyana bhavan who has helped us tremendously by providing this wonderful venue thank you all i also thank and acknowledge our friends from the media fraternity who have covered this event and also given us publicity in this media thank you all i also thank our support team sound systems photography videography sampark vibhag prachar vibhag and all the members who had directly or indirectly contributed to this successful event last but not the least you the audience the erudite audience for coming and gracing this event i would like to acknowledge the presence of many notable personalities here thank you all for being this on such a wonderful audience thank you sir thank you one and all now we will have a book signing session whoever have purchased a book or have bought the book can come here in an order and get the book signed thank you uh, please please give your feedback form in the counter there yeah yeah from